Please join us for an inspirational message from Pastor D. Cairoli of the Roosevelt Christian Assembly. Just a word about uh, Wade, Wade Large and, and the family. Um, uh, Wade, Wade and Large was a huge part of this church early, early on, like in the early 80s and stuff, and was responsible for a lot of parking lot conversions, a lot of pe- praying with people in the parking lot and that kind of thing. A great musician, but he suffers from some health issues, and so he hasn't been able to come and, and you know, jam with us. But Susie's been playing with him since, what, 75 or something like that? A long time, you know? They used to have a, they were in the paper all the time. They had, you know, pictures of him in the paper. But um, just a great man, a great guy, great, wonderful man of God. And, and Patty was awesome. She was just a, a lot of fun, you know. She'd always say things about Wade, you know. <laughs> it's like... Kind of reminds me of somebody I know that has comments all the time. I love you, honey. You're awesome. But anyway, so the bottom line is uh, uh, be praying for them. And like Jessica said, very important. They, they really need some help, and they've been struggling with COVID and, you know, and all kinds of issues as well. So be, be praying for them and, uh, and help them. Um, I think we're dealing with the dinners and got everything covered, right? Is that right, Brian? Debbie? Oh, right? Working on everything. Yeah, we may call you and say, hey, we need you to help us. We're good. We're good. Everything's fantastic. All right. Well, let's, uh, no children's church today, by the way. Cause, so we're going to keep it here. Keep it real. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this, uh, for this day today and for this opportunity that we have to hear your word. And I ask that you help us today. Help us to uh, be able to digest what you have for us and help us not only to digest it, but to put it to nourishment in our, in our actions and what we do with our, with our lives, Lord. And we thank you for everything that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is part four of a series that, I'm, that we're doing uh, called The Plan for Action. And uh, there'll probably be one or two more parts, and then after that we'll, we'll revert back to regular things. But... Um, but definitely a, um, a plan for discipleship, a plan for how to, uh, you know, move along. And all these things are, are teasers, if you will, because every single one of them you can do a series of sermons on. So it's not just one subject, okay, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, ready to go to the next one. It's a very, very long process, actually. And that's where Wednesday night comes in. Wednesday night's where you really get to meet, where you really get to discuss these things, to look through the the, the different aspects of it, the different aspects of these uh, doctrines, if you will, and learn the, the real meat and potatoes of what it is to be a Christian. It's not just about going to church. It's not just about saying you're a Christian. It's about knowing what you believe and why you believe it. It's very important. I have the books ready for those of you that are coming on Wednesdays. I have about seven of them, and, uh, and we'll be distributing those and ordering some more as time permits. And, and then shipping and good old FedEx. <laughs> Pray for FedEx. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> A lot of help so uh, but definitely um, you know uh, keep that in mind we're going to be trying to work through those things and get through that we've been through a lot of things already the deity of Christ the authority of scripture the trinity we've been through a lot of the basic doctrines a lot of t- we're going moving on to the salvation of man and the fall of man and why we need salvation and what sanctification is and what glorification is what what are these steps that we take as we move forward, growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. So that, that's on Wednesday night. So be here. Please be here. I know it's hard sometimes. You think, oh man, another. just be here. Really, it'll, it'll be a blessing for you. And plus you get cookies, free. And maybe even donuts. Who knows? Somebody might. <clears throat> or those little cinnamon things, twist things that come hot in the box. No, no stop. I'm having a carb moment right now. A, de- a keto demon's trying to get to me. But, um, but anyway, just to review real quick, uh, the title of today's message, of course, Plan for Action, Part 4. And the title today is Disco Serve. Remember Disco? No. Discovery of Service is what that stands for. Discover Service. Amen. And, and a lot of times people don't realize that they have to discover that there's so many great things available for us that we don't realize until we start doing them. And then it's like, wow, this is fun. I never knew it was going to be this great, you know. So it's a lot of good things. Anyway, commitment, number one, we talked about that in the first series. A transfer of hope from Jesus to Jesus alone, from, from just thinking about Jesus. So saying, yeah, I, I believe in you, but to a transfer of hope so all your eggs are in that basket, all your life, your future, your past, everything is in the basket 
that Jesus holds. Amen. And that transfer of hope is called conversion when you give it over to him. And that takes, of course, we talked about some of the steps to that. It takes repentance. It takes a, a, a mental awareness. It also takes a volitional awareness. So kind of like a, 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 a heart change, right? And a direction change. You, you go from going this way, you change and you go this way and you follow Christ. So that's what conversion is about. We talked about commitment. We also talked about being called to be a disciple. You're not just called to say you're a Christian. You're called to be a Christian and to do things that are that are that are part of that to, to learn and to grow in, in the grace and knowledge of Christ to learn to be a follower and a learner not just somebody that has a mental thing well I have Jesus I have a picture of him on my wall no it's about really stepping in to his life and getting to know him more the more you know him the more you love him the more you want to serve him the more good things happen amen and then last week we talked about making disciples what it's like to make disciples you know it's our our motto here, be a disciple, make a disciple. Very simple mission statement. Not hard, not a bunch of sentences. You don't need a lawyer. <laughs> right? It's very simple. Be a disciple. In other words, follow Jesus, do what he says to do. And the next step is now duplicate yourself. Amen. And so we talked about helping others to know Jesus. You don't need a degree in, the in theology. You need to penetrate the darkness. You need to be able to get people an inch closer than where they were. Some people are almost there. They almost are there to that point where they turn it over to God. And others are way over here, have no knowledge of God whatsoever. No idea that there's even a God that exists. No idea that there was a person named Jesus. Right? You're thinking, well, in our culture, in our situation, in our world, you mean people are still out there that don't know? Yes, there's people out there that don't know, have zero knowledge. So if you can get them just an inch closer, a millimeter closer to that point, where they get to surrender their life over to Jesus Christ, you're in the process of creating a disciple. Amen. It's not about just handing out a tract or, or getting somebody to pray through. That is important, and it should be a big part of it to finish the deal. But the bottom line is it starts at a very early point. Amen. So helping others to know Jesus, penetrating darkness. Today we're going to be talking about serving. And I know that's the S word. Some people don't want to hear the serve part. Oh no, I got to work. I know, I don't like that. I don't have to work. I'm saved by grace through faith. Not that of my, right? I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have to do it. You know, I, I don't have to work. I, well, no, you, you, you know, I, know, I understand that. You're not saved right by works, but you're created onto good works, the Bible says. So today we're going to do a different kind of a, well, not different. I used to do these all the time, but it's called an expository sermon. We take just one block of scripture and we, we go through it and really juice it out and see exactly what it's t talking to us about. Without taking all the time to discover context of, of 1 Peter, like we're going to do and talk about the whole book, we're just going to grab some scriptures in chapter 4. So if you want to put your thumb or whatever on chapter 4, we're going to be starting on verse 7, but not right now. Jimmy, hang on. But, uh, but basically, practical Christianity is what we're talking about. Practical Christianity. That means practicing Christianity. Right? And, and taking the word and seeing what it can do for us. A lot of times the word of God will get into us and empower us to do the things that we need to do. Will challenge us to, you know, to, to hear the word. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. As we hear the word, we start applying it. Next thing you know, we start doing things that we never thought possible. Amen. And so we see this. It was, it's going to accomplish God's will. It, it'll help us uh, to be a blessing not only to ourselves but to others. It'll help us to not only discover, uh, but, but to understand the best place for you to be. See, God's will is, 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 is amazing. When you are in God's will, you're in the best place you could possibly be. You could be living in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a tent with a tin can for dinner, and you could be in the middle of God's will and be more blessed than somebody in a mansion. Amen? Right? So the center of God's will is where you want to be, and how do we get there? What's the purpose? the the, the way, the path to get there, to be able to understand how to get there. Today we're going to examine a portion of scripture that, that, that really speaks to this. To understand that there's joy in serving, there's, there's, there's great opportunity in serving. It's not just about uh, mowing somebody's lawn or, or, or fixing something. It's more about being in God's will, amen, and, and operating in God's will. But what really is serving? How's it done? Well, the word to serve in the Bible, and we're going to be looking at this, is the word diakonia, which, which, which is the Greek word. It really means waiting on tables. And that's where the word deacon comes from. You know, they were waiting on tables. They were helping feed people. 
right? And then they wound up preaching. <laughs> but, but they were doing that. They were, they were serving. They were, they, were, they were not just you know, writing checks and saying, okay, I got this covered. I gave. I did my part. But actually doing things like that. You were serving. They were, walk, they were walking in that spirit. They were doing uh, 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 great things to be able to help people that were hurting financially, hurting uh, uh, with, with food, not being able to be fed, medically helping. All these areas, they started to help and heal and strengthen. So the first thing that we have to understand is perspective. So let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, starting from verse 7. And I'm just going to read this little block of scripture, and then we'll go back and start at one verse at a time, or one word at a time. It says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, let him speak as it were, the utterances of God. Whoever serves, let him do so by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the first thing I want you to see is perspective. Is we need a perspective of where things are at. Okay, so for instance, the right mindset, the right approach comes from perspective. If you have the right perspective, then you have the right approach, the right mindset. You understand the situation much better, right? As my friend Elliot Chodoff would say, you take a picture, like taking a picture, and you can see where everything is in the picture, and you react to the things that are in the picture, right? <laughs> you can see the picture. You know, and this is where sometimes we get a little bit kind of uh, off, off kilter a little bit. It's not our father which art in Mighton. I'm saying that because, you know, I love Mighton. Don't get me wrong. I love you, Mighton. Thank you. North Mighton Bench, okay? Hey, power to the people, right, Mike? Power to the people. But, uh, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, the, the whole thing about, about where God is, where is he? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I know I'm going off scripture, but, but you, know, you know the drill. It's thy will be done, right, on earth as it is in heaven. It's, it, that's the perspective we have to understand. It's God's perspective for us. And sometimes we get a little bit off kilter. And like I said, sometimes, you know, the end of all things is at hand, it says here. The end of all things is at hand. Now, I've been saying that since Peter's day. In other words... Jesus could come back today. He could come back tomorrow. It, it could be the end of all things. No, nowhere else and no, at no other time in my lifetime that I've ever seen things come to a head like they're coming today. You have Russia moving against Ukraine. Maybe that's something. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. Is it going to affect the Middle East? Could be. Warm water port. Who knows what's happening there? All kinds of issues going on. Iran, right? The deal with Iran, Israel, Iran, Turkey. Militizing doing, militarizing, doing some crazy things, all kinds of things going on. And we'll talk about those things. I preach on end times at least two, three, four times a year. But, you know, but that's not the focus. Uh, again, uh, it's important to know about end times things, but the perspective is right now. Where are we right now? Where's your neighbor right now? Where's your family right now? Do they care about what color socks the Antichrist is wearing? You know what I mean? It's just we need to focus on perspective and get the right set of things going on. The end of all things is to therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer, it says here. The NIV actually says so that you can be in a, in a, in a right perspective of prayer. See, prayer is more than uh, Father bless this food, help us nourish our bodies, uh, uh, allow lay me down to sleep, and, uh, pray my soul to keep. You know. uh, prayer is more than that. Prayer is, is, is tactical. In a sense like this, if you just pray the same old prayer every day, which we fall into, I do it, we all do it, that, that's not good. We need to be able to focus and do the things that really matter according to our perspective, according to God's perspective, according to his will. We want to pray things that matter to God. In other words, he's calling on you to, to get a burden somehow. Maybe you're praying for somebody to, to be able to, uh, to receive uh, a healing. Maybe you're praying for somebody to get right with God. Maybe you're praying for the, the family. Maybe you're praying for uh, the college. Maybe you're praying for the schools to be safe. Whatever, whatever it is, target your prayers. Laser focus on, on those prayers. And so that's the perspective. Once you have an eternal perspective, 
the right perspective, the end of all things is at hand. Is it? Yes, I believe so. I believe at any time the rapture could happen and we could be in that situation, right? It makes it easier to make the right choices when you have the right perspective with ourselves, with others, how we affect the kingdom of God. So you're a warrior. You're all warriors. You're all soldiers in, the, in God's army. You're all called to do something for God. And it's not just, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. And pray my Lord to soul to keep. Uh, yeah, good, but let's move it a little, let's kick it up a notch, as Emerald used to say. And so, uh, so the things that you say and do really do matter. They, they really do matter to people. If we were to act and live and think like, like Jesus is coming back today, if, if we just put that into perspective, what if Jesus comes back tonight or tomorrow? What, what are you going to do with the next 12 hours, with the next 24 hours? What are you going to do? How are you going to act? What are you going to say? What are you going to do? You see, the perspective is everything. Now, again, we need to plan like he's not coming back for 50, 60, 80, 100 years. But we need to live like he's coming back this minute. Right? And if you do that, then you, you're never going to be caught you know, on the hillside someplace wearing Nike sneakers and waiting for the spaceship to show up. You know what I mean? It, it's just gonna, you're going to be serious about this thing. So it, the, world, you know, the world could change a lot in, in, in a very fast, incredibly fast uh, block of time now. It seems like things change overnight. You know, situations change overnight. Uh, directives change overnight. And so we have to be able to understand the eternal perspective. And then second of all, be watchful. It says here, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Sound judgment and, and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. That means to be careful. It means to be careful. It means to stay sober. And I'm not talking about not drinking. You shouldn't be drinking and getting drunk anyway, right? That's a no-brainer. We shouldn't be doing that. But you can fall into being drunk about small stuff. You can fall into small stuff about a relationship. You can be drunk on a relationship. You can be drunk on emotions. You could be on a roller coaster ride of fear or a roller coaster ride of hate or a roller coaster ride of just being blinded by whatever situation. You're just kind of up and down, up and down. If I feel good today, then everything's fine. If I don't feel good, something's wrong with me. Or if I don't feel good, I must have done something wrong and upset God. And this kind of roller coaster thing, depending on your works, depending on your ability to do things. You know, to be able to feel good or not, or to be able to accomplish things or not. Uh, you can be drunk on passions, on worldly tours. You can take a worldly tour and start, you know, whatever. It could be anything. It could be anything could become a problem. Anything could be an idol. Anything can drive you away. So that's why it says to be of sober spirit, right? To be careful, to be, to be of sound judgment, sober spirit, right? Uh, overzealous interests is another one. And even in the, in the Bible, you look it back on, um, if you remember, remember, you guys remember, I can't talk today, remember Y2K? Remember? Y2K, your toaster was going to jump up and attack you in the middle of the night because the computer chip in the toaster was going to go off, or your microwave was going to blow up your house, you know? All these fears, and, they, and people had, you know, entire, you know, uh, prophecy uh, shows on this, you know? entire series and, and, and things and the four blood moons and this and that and everything's like, oh, right now, no, stop, stop, time out, time out, got it, got it, yeah, great, interesting, great, put it aside. Numerology, another one. Oh, the, the Bible, if you just take it and count this way and count that way, it spells the name of Ronald Reagan or... Okay. <laughs> but, but again, you know, we need to exercise our pilgrim mentality we need to understand that we're going through this place, that this is Motel Earth. We're not staying here forever. This is just a passing through point. Our goal is heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. So, so when we look at that, that's the perspective, a healthy perspective. When you put that eternal perspective in mind, now it leads to something else. It leads to solid prayer. Because now your prayers are not just willy-nilly, not just thrown up in the air. Now they're solid. They're solid and they're targeted and they're focused, amen? They have a, a purpose to them. Prayer is communing with God, not just making requests, right? It's but talking to Him, worshiping Him, but at the same time, it's also being specific about things. 
not only specific about your needs, like we talked about last week a little bit, but the needs of others. Let God put a burden in your heart and then pray through that burden to see what God wants you to do about it. He'll talk to you. He'll speak to you. He'll give you the direction. He'll give you the, the open doors to, what, to go through. Amen. We just need to learn to understand that, that God is willing and wanting to help us to accomplish great things. He's not sitting there, well, when you prove yourself, then I'll, I'll, I'll graduate you. No, he's looking, come on, let's go. Let's, we can do this together. Amen. So, you know, Peter could preach on prayer. He could preach on prayer really well. But what happened to Peter in the garden when he was waiting for Jesus, right? How long did he make it? He couldn't even make it an hour, right? Jesus is like, come on, man. I, I told you to pray. This is important to me. Will you please pray? Right? right? I mean, that's normal. That's what we do. We fall asleep. When we go to pray, I, again, me, I'm the same way. You know, I go to prayer and I hear the, talk, the clock ticking, you know, click, click, click. What, what is that? Is that something? Somebody's, is it the spaceship calling me home again? <laughs> it's okay, you're fine. <laughs> anyway, um, a, a prayer is communion with God. It's, it's, it's worshiping. And Peter could preach on prayer. Why? Because he had failed. Because he was the one that let Jesus down. He's the one that couldn't hang on. And could you imagine the guilt trip that he went on afterwards, after he denied Christ three times? Why couldn't I have prayed with him like he told me? Why couldn't I have just hung on just a little bit longer? If only I would have done this. If only I would have done that. Instead of just saying, Lord, <laughs> did, I blow, did I ever blow it? And help me not do it again. And that's what he wound up doing eventually, because now he knows how to talk on prayer. He knows how to talk on what to do and what not to do. Amen? The sound prayer... Uh, is extremely important. Sober prayer is incredibly important. Uh, we can't accomplish anything without prayer, right? We need to have prayer first, then we can accomplish it. I've made the horrible mistake many, many, many times in ministry and in life where I haven't prayed about something and I've made a decision. I, I, I've, you know, said, come on, let's do this, or let's do this, and I haven't prayed about it. And next thing you know, it falls apart. And then I'm wondering why it fell apart because I didn't pray first, right? And, and I have a wonderful wife that tells me, you need to pray about that. We need to pray about that before you do it. No, no, you should. did you pray about that? No, you know, so it's amazing how if you don't, this is what happens, you blow it. So we need to understand that prayer is part of this sound prayer is understanding where it falls in. You know, we need to obviously uh, do unhindered prayers. It says here, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. And then, in, and the reason why is because if you put the right perspective in, if you're sound judgment and, and, and trying to focus your prayers that way, God will lead you to even more focus. God will lead you to more detail. God will lead you to more intense things that you can deal with. But you have to have unhindered prayer. Back in chapter 3, right, just a few verses back, it talks about being, as a guy, you have to live with your wife in an understanding way. Right? And you have to treat her right. If you don't, it says your prayers won't be answered. Right? And it's true about your children, too. You don't want to sit there and be a jerk to your kids right? and then expect God to bless you. It doesn't mean you don't discipline them. It doesn't mean you don't you know, put your foot down and go, no, you're not going to this. You're not getting a car. You're not doing that, whatever. But the bottom line is you still got to love them. And when you do, as you love them and as you help them and you strengthen them and, and encourage them and don't knock them down verbally, Next thing you know, your prayers are answered, right? Your prayers are unhindered. So it, it says here, in, um, the, the, so the next thing would be to that, when you have unhindered prayer, it leads to something else. And verse 8 says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. So first of all, I want you to see this, that the word fervent here, in the Greek, it's ektenes, which means a stretch, and it really denotes a, a, a runner, that's running towards the finish line and it's kind of equal with the other guys you know or the gals or whatever and, and at the last second last minute he stretches forth kind of gives that last little push that last little right pushes forward when you do bikes you know um, road bikes when they used to race road bikes they still do I guess at the finish line you see him pushing the bike forward you go you know wait a minute you're not but it's that little extra follow through right it's like golf you know the swing you know just kind of that that follow through, that extra little push that gets you to the right place. And that's what that is, about being fervent. It's what it means. It's keeping that little bit extra 
that little bit more than what you're supposed to do. In other words, this says to do this, just push it a little harder, just a little bit more, and see what happens, right? And great things happen because of that, because then it talks about fervent, right? Fervent love, a runner straining at the gate kind of thing, uh, but it leads to agape, right? It says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. So as you push that little bit extra like that, what happens is God's love all of a sudden starts to take control. God's love starts to take command in the situation. There's several words for love in the New Testament, and we've been through this before, but agape is the love that only God can provide. And the, God, and, the, and the love that you can mirror from God, the love that he gives that mirrors, that you're able to mirror out, right? It's never a love that you work up. It's never a love that you try harder in that sense. But what it means is that when it's time to do something, when it's time to help somebody, push just a little bit harder, and then his love comes in. Amen. And that only rewards, but it does other things like cover a multitude of sins. Right? So as we're talking about this, again, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a choice that we make. Love is a choice that we make. It's not a feeling. It's a choice that we make, a decision of the will leading to action. So it's something that we try to do. We push a little harder with what we've got, and then God fills it with his love and, does, and takes it in an incredible way. You see this in people that, that, um, that have uh, horrible things done to their family or situations or whatever, persecutions, people that are being persecuted, and they tell their captors, they tell their jailers, you know, uh, God loves you, I forgive you. And you're like, what? I want to kill this guy. He's not going to get out of here. Who said that? <laughs> but you know what I mean? I mean, if you're being persecuted, your, fe- your initial natural feeling is to get back and don't let them get away with it, you know, right? But the bottom line is that God, it's not God's way. And so when, when God fills you with that love, you know, when you say, well, I'm going to try, I'm going to make that attempt, I'm going to try to forgive, I know I can't, it's hard to forgive, I don't know if I can, but I'm going to give it that little extra shot, all of a sudden here comes God's love and completes the picture for you and takes you even further than you ever thought you could go. So, so when you look at this, it, it's, it's basically giving, again, love is giving people what they need the most when they deserve it the least. That's the best definition of love I've ever heard. And that's from Chip Ingram, by the way. So if any of you are Chip Ingram followers, he's the one that I got that from, I stole it from. I usually give credit when I steal something. But, uh, but love causes, causes great things to happen. Is it a sacrifice? Yes. Is, 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 it, is it good for you? Yes. Is, is it worth it? Absolutely. Right? But the bottom line is this, is that as you exercise this extra little push, this fervency, this stretching to the line, God, God's love comes in and it covers a multitude of sins. Whose sin? Their sin? My sin? Our sin? All of our sin. That doesn't cover every sin because some things you need to deal with. You can't just say, well, I fed somebody, so therefore all my sins are gone. No, that's works. That's not what I'm talking about. But there's a lot of little things that we don't realize. When God whips out the microscope and you start seeing all the things that you should have done, <laughs> that you could have done, the sins of omission, all those things that you thought weren't a big deal, but they are a big deal. All those times that you had bad thoughts, all those times that you said things under your breath, all those times that you did what X, Y, Z, whatever, those things, if you want to see sin, if you really want to see sin, if you want to go by the works of the law, then, then here you go, boy. Right? But love covers a multitude of sin, all those little things, all those things that you should be able to let go anyway. All of a sudden, like on those offenses that are done to you that you think, oh man, I can't believe. All of a sudden, it's like washed away. Why? Because God's love is in it. Amen. God's love starts to take over and starts to do things. Proverbs 10, 12, I'm going to go off scripture for a minute. It says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. And that's, you know, when, he, when Peter's quoting this, he's kind of, I'm sure he's thinking of that Psalm, excuse me, that Proverb 10, 12. Love forgives and doesn't let unforgiveness rule. Agape love is concrete acts of kindness, not emotions. Concrete acts of kindness, choices that you make. As a Christian, we forgive others because we realize that we've been forgiven. And that's what really starts to set the ball in motion. You may not be able to forgive somebody. You may be hurt, and things do hurt, and it is a problem. 
But as you, as you start taking those steps, like, God, I want to be forgiving. I want to learn how to forgive. Help me to forgive. Next thing you know, he takes you a step further and a step further and a step further or a step closer and closer to him. And then you realize what you've done, how much forgiveness you've received, and you start having more grace, more mercy towards that other person. And eventually, there'll be forgiveness, there'll be restoration, there'll be all kinds of great things that'll happen after that. So love does have its rewards. When you extend the love of God, you're right where you need to be in the will of God. In other words, when you're extending God's love, when you become the vehicle for God's love, that's when good things start to happen. We call it a sweet spot, right? Heavy in golf, sweet spot, right? When you hit the driver just right and it doesn't go four fairways over like me. <laughs> I was like, wait, whoa, four, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I mean, to hit you in the head. <laughs> That's why I don't golf. Actually, I think the last time I golfed, the second to last time I golfed, was when, when Aaron here asked me for Je Jana's hand in marriage, and now they got a 12-year-old daughter. So that's about the, the, my golfing thing these days, right? So like once every eight years or something, I'll be out there. And, and, and they clear the, 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 the way for me, so I don't hurt anybody. So, um, so how should, you know, now that we, we know how to kind of start pushing to, in the right direction to start receiving God's love, uh, when we start showing that love, when we become the vehicles for God's love, right? That leads us to do something else. And it goes on here to say in verse 9. It says, be hospitable to one another without complaint or without murmuring. The, the, the actual the thing is murmuring. How many of us do things and then we murmur about it? Right? I, <laughs> be hospitable, right? And, and so, so what does that mean? And, you know, in, our, in their culture, it meant putting somebody up in their home, a traveler coming through, putting them up in their home. In, in our culture today, with our situation today, that may be pretty difficult, especially if you have young children or something in the home. You don't know who you're bringing in. You don't know what the situation is. There's a lot of people out there with some very serious problems that, that don't belong in your home necessarily. You can show hospitality, and you can feed and do things and maybe even get together and help them, but does it mean you have to open your home and then, you know, because bad things can happen sometimes. So we have to be very careful as well. And I'm not telling you to just let anybody in and it doesn't matter, just pray God will protect you. Yes, he probably will, but at the same time, he gives us a brain, doesn't he? Does he give us a brain? And some things you have to be very careful. When somebody is uh, in the throes of a demonic episode, and uh, I'm very familiar with that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, when, you're the, when somebody's in the throes of a demonic episode, right, you, you, you don't, sometimes they're not ready to be delivered. They're not ready to, to turn to Jesus. They're still on that path that needs to kind of get to a certain place. And you can pray for them and help them and strengthen them, but you don't let them into the kitchen drawer with the knives. You know, just some things you just don't, you know, you got to be careful. Uh, so we have to be very careful. Open your home to fellowship, yes. Services in your home, absolutely. Check with me and I'll help you with that. Give you the materials so we don't start teaching weird stuff, okay? <laughs> we don't want to teach uh, sacrificing chickens or voodoo things, voodoo ceremonies. In the, uh, don't laugh, but that happened once. Um, so home Bible studies, plenty of resources available that, that we can help. You know, we got that uh, thing we just talked about, the, uh, the, the uh, Right Now Media, right? Where it has watch groups and Bible studies and you can be doing a Bible study with other people online as a group and be commenting back and forth like you're just in the living room but you maybe you can't because you, you schedule or whatever there's all kinds of great things that you can accomplish just just from that kind of thing so so we're in that process where we're doing those things that we need to do we're applying the resources trying to be hospitable in whatever way we can if you see a, a homeless person for instance you know uh, go buy them a, a gift certificate to mcdonald's you know Always do food. Don't ever give money because it's, just, it's a weakness. It could be a problem. It could wind up in the wrong thing and they could be buying dope and hurting themselves with it. So be sure that you, you be a blessing, but don't be, don't be stupid, as my friend used to say. Right? And so, um, so what happens? In that process of being hospitable, 
in that process of, of starting to do things in your home or, or extending your home out to other places or trying to come up with ways of being hospitable. And again, it doesn't have to be putting people up necessarily or feeding people. It could be other things. It could be teaching, holding a little study, doing a little encouragement group. I talked last week about having like a razor group, you know, a group that goes out and runs, does razor runs and then stops at the top of the mountain and has a little devotional, you know, kind of like an extension of you, of what you do, what you love to do and kind of put it to work. Uh, gifts will start working. The gifts of the Spirit will start working if you start putting yourself in a position where you are going to use them. The gifts of the Spirit don't show up when you're sitting on your blessed assurance, right? On the couch, kind of waiting. One day, Lord, when you give me those gifts, then I'll be able to go out and evangelize the world. Well, I'll be able to... No, no, just get up and start walking. You take a step, God puts you another one in the way. One step, one foot in front of the other. Next thing you know, you're taking bigger strides and bigger strides and big things are happening, great things are happening, and you're like, whoa, 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 where am I? Whoa, what's going on here? Right? But God's doing it, right? And he's giving you those gifts to be able to do that. So this is the next group of scripture here. It's verse 9, be hospitable to one another without complaint. And verse 10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. See, when you connect the dots, when you put things in the right perspective, when that leads you to targeted, focused prayer, which leads you to fervent love as you start extending yourself a little bit more, giving a little bit more, helping a little bit more, pushing that envelope just a little bit more, next thing you know, God's love makes it possible for you to be hospitable, for you to love others in a way that you never thought possible. And next thing you know, at that moment, the gifts start to come around. And you start utilizing the gifts of God, the gifts of the Spirit. And this is where sometimes we get confused a little bit. Every Christian has the ability to have gifts of the Spirit operational in their life. And we'll talk about them next week a little bit more. But, but, it's, but it's not all the spoken gifts. It's not all the, the preaching or the teaching or anything. It's not always that. But everybody has a, a gift that God wants to use you in. And the problem that we have now is that the churches these days, a lot of churches, are focused on, on, on success and on, on your best life now and on, and on you know, you know, rah, 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 and, and let's have a great uh, experience and let's feel good. All that's important, yes, it's great. It's a byproduct of knowing the Word of God and using it and, and willingly subject it to the Word of God. When you do that, then good things will happen. Sometimes it feels great. Sometimes you feel like, oh, man. Huh? But the Word of God penetrates the darkness. The Word of God is what accomplishes things, amen, through the Spirit of God. So all of a sudden, the gifts will start working. The gifts will start flourishing. The problem that people have is they think, well, I'm a good salesman, so I'll be a great evangelist. Well, I'm really good at talking to people, therefore I should be... No, wait a minute, time out a second. You know, I know people that are great salesmen, right? But they're not very good at evangelizing, right? But they're great salesmen, but they're, they're great at other aspects of other gifts, you know? And so it doesn't matter what your natural gifts are. There are things that you're born to do that you're just really good at, whether you be a craftsman or you're... You're good with numbers. You know, everybody needs a bean counter, right? We all need a, somebody to keep things straight. We, everybody has their gift and their ability. But that's separate from the spiritual gifts that you got. Now, sometimes God will combine the two at times. But for the most part, if you're good at this, doesn't mean that you do that. It means you wait for God to tell you what's going to happen. It could be something totally, totally different. Uh, most of you know, I got saved. And when I got saved, uh, you know, I'd been playing music and you know, jamming around and doing blues and rock kind of stuff. And, you know, when I got saved, all that stopped instantly. And, and for almost, I don't know, I'd say eight years, but maybe it was a little less than that, maybe five or six, really, where it got to the point where every time I'd reach for that guitar, it was like God saying, nope, not now, not yet. It'll be there when you need it. I remember specifically hearing that, not audibly, but hearing that in my soul. Nope, not yet. It'll be there when you need it. Nope, not yet. It'll be there when you need it. No, not yet. It'll be there when you need it. Every time I'd reach, a, you know, and I pick it up and I just feel like this isn't right. right. But eventually, little by little, God wanted me to get into this first. He knew that if I did that more, then I'd be focused on that. He wanted me to stay on this. And that's what I did. I digested this like no other. 
and that helped me to later on put that in the right perspective and put that in the right place. But it, that just because I had a, maybe some of you call it a curse. <laughs> I, my wife could tell you it's a curse when you're playing on a stack of a stack of amplifiers like that, making all weird noises. You <laughs> type were crazy. I just, but uh, but I mean that was, might might have been somebody's vision of a gift, but it wasn't a gift. It wasn't God's gift, you know. And now God uses maybe whatever I have to, as I give it as an offering to God, but it's not my spiritual gift, if you will. Does that make sense to everybody? Sorry, I had to, went a little rapid trail there. But, but gifts will start working. Fruit will fl flourish. Every Christian has, the, has an ability to serve God in their own special way. And don't ever think that, well, God's not going to use me. I'm not special enough. I don't have talent. I don't have this. That, this, that, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. You know, there's a lot, I was watching a thing uh, on uh, YouTube the other day. Brendan and I were watching it on celebrities that have given their life over to Christ, unashamedly given their life over to Christ, that publicly say, I, I want to follow Jesus Christ. I'm a believer in Christ. I want to I repent of my old life. I have, you know, and it, it's hard because those guys lose a lot of business. They lose a lot of, a lot of dough. But there's some good guys out there that are on screens, you know, uh, and I'm not going to say the name because then if we say, oh yeah, but he did this movie that way, I don't know. But all I know is that some of their testimonies are like, man, that, that's real. That's not, that's, not, that's not just Hollywood, you know, that, that's a real thing. And, um, and so a lot of people think, oh, if only, you know, uh, you name whoever, the basketball star, the singer, the, the, the great musician, the great whatever, politician, I guess they can't get saved. Uh, let's talk, <laughs> but whoever it is, you say, oh, if only they would come to the Lord. Could you imagine all the people? Yeah, but it's a hollow thing when it's like that. Because, yeah, a lot of people come around, but it's all about the worshiping him and not worshiping God. They, they, they get all caught up in that moment of like, oh, yeah, Jay-Z, this, that, whatever. I don't know whoever, what these people are. I don't pay attention to all that stuff. But whoever it is, it's like, oh, it's this guy here, Johnny, whatever. <gasps> yeah, and it's like all about them. And then when, when they're tested, when, when their faith is put on the line, when they enter that classroom and they're going, oh, you're a believer in Jesus, oh, <clears throat> you know. And all of a sudden, they have to defend and stand up for what they believe, and they fall apart because their faith isn't in Christ. It's in some celebrity. So, so this is different than what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about natural gifts or the ability that God has given you naturally to do things, a gift that he's given you, abilities he's given you, and then your spiritual gifts, two different things. Sometimes they intersect. But don't look for either one to be the other. Amen? So, so em employ it. Minister it to one another. That's what it says here. As each one has received a special gift, verse 10, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Use it. Use it. Don't confuse it. Use it, right? Uh, be, be a servant and serve. Amen. It's very easy to just start the ball rolling. Start, you know, start moving. Start walking. Uh, it, it's, it's different, again, than the natural gifts. You can say, I don't have a gift. I don't feel like I have a gift. Everyone has been given something that they can operate in. And sometimes multiple areas that you're not even aware of. Multiple areas that, that come into play when you start doing things. Um, you have to redirect your natural impulses to do things. Let's say you're good at some sport or you're good at something and you think, well, I can use that to, to, uh, to bring people to God. Yeah, maybe you could. There's chaplains out there that do that. There are rodeo people. There's chaplains that are NASCAR people. There's you know, all kinds of different people that are in those things because that's their, their, their love and their passion and God has chosen them to be in that specific place. But it doesn't mean, one, don't take it for one minute, that you, you that you should just focus on that. You need to redirect whatever it is you have. You put it on a platter. Whatever it is you have, you put it on a platter and say, Lord, it's yours. If you want to take this away, go for it. If you want me to use it, go for it. If you want to increase it, go for it. If you want me to focus on something else, go for it. That's what you need to do when it comes to these gifts, when it comes to serving. You have to understand that. Um, there's a lot of great things. Good stewards. You have to be a good steward. You have to be a good manager, right? Uh, the Greek word there means that you're, that you're uh, like a, over a farm. You're over people. You're over 
workers, you're, you're, you're managing things, you're, you're taking care of people. Jesus uses it where he says, uh, be that good servant that fed people, that helped, that kept people uh, strong, that, that did his work. Be that good steward, that good manager that did that. That's what we need to all be. All of us are called to do that. And then, of course, there's the, there's the different gifts. Uh, it says, verse 11, says, whoever speaks, let him speak, as it were, the utterances of God. Whoever serves, let him do so by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Let's look at this for a minute. Verse 11, speaking. Again, these are the gifts that God gives. These are the gifts that God gives, right? Speaking. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I can speak because I don't know if I want to get in front of all the people in church. Well, what about the break room? What about the classroom? What about out in the commons? What about at your workplace? At, you know, just sitting with somebody and you're building something and you start talking. Why can't you open your mouth and start speaking there? It's like, you know, I can't remember. It's been a long time now, but somebody came and says, well, I, I think I should, be, I should teach adults. I remember that guy? <laughs> I, I need to... To, to teach Sunday school. I said, good, uh, great. Well, let's keep an eye on you for a while, see how you do. Maybe you can start you off and you can help in children's church or, or you know, with the, oh, no, I need to teach adults. I'm like, well, well, wait a minute. If you're teaching, you're teaching. Now, I'm not, I think teaching kids is so much harder than teaching adults. But in a way, they retain so much more. <laughs> Kids will remember stuff from week to week. Us adults, you know. But, but the reality of it is this, is that you have to be willing to whatever. Okay, hey, you know, I, maybe I'm not going to speak at, the, at Madison Square Garden tomorrow. Maybe I'm not going to go to the Vivint Arena and, and speak there. But, uh, but I'm here in Roosevelt and I'm here at work with somebody or I'm here in the break room with some people and I'm just going to share and hand them a book and say, hey, check this out, look at this, this is cool, you know. Am I speaking? Am I speaking the utterances of God? Absolutely. Some of the best prophecies that you can think of happen over a kitchen table. Having coffee with somebody. And all of a sudden, God drops something in your soul and you just speak it out. Not like, you know, get the, the robe on, get the burlap sack on, get the, the, you know, the hand to the east, you know, the, the one hair floating in the air. As you're, you know, and thus saith God. You know, not, I'm not talking like that. I'm talking about like all of a sudden, it just builds up inside of you and you just something comes out. And you're like, whoa, where would that come from? You know? And all of a sudden, that person's eyes are like this big, and like, you know, and, and you know that something penetrated in there. Now, now, were you some kind of prophet or some kind of like a, you know, carrying around a, a big entourage of people and flying in a plane? Or, no. God used you in the spot where you needed to be used. Amen. And he'll do that over and over and over and over again in different places. Gifts of service. Again, we talked about preaching. Well, you know, some people can preach, some people can't. Some people teach, some people can't teach, and they can preach, but they can't teach. Some people teach, but they can't preach. It just kind of goes back and forth. Some people cross paths somewhere, right? Different situations. Some people are good at instructing. Some people are good at getting the, 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 the stuff, as, as uh, Donald J. Barnhouse used to say, getting the, the hay from the loft and bringing it down where people can eat it, right? Where the, where the cows can eat it. Is you're, you're bringing it down to where people go, oh, I get it. I, you know, that, that's, a, that's a speaking gift. Amen. And God can use that when he directs it. Not because you think you're a good school teacher. Well, I'm a good instructor. Or I'm a good this. Yeah, great. But that doesn't mean he can teach Bible stuff. Only God can teach Bible stuff. The things of God are foolishness to the natural mind. If you're, not, if you're looking at this through a natural lens, you don't understand. It does not make sense. And it's stupid. But when you have the Spirit of God empowering, all of a sudden it clicks. And it starts clicking more and more and more and more. And you get hungrier and hungrier and you want to just devour everything. And you want to keep growing and keep going. Amen. You can't stop. So then there's the gifts of service. You know, can, uh, let me back up a minute. Gifts of speaking. Can you help somebody navigate through their Bible? You, you know, how many times, you know, when I'm, I'm teaching or I'm something. And I go, turn with me to, uh, to the book of Amos or... To, to simple, let's Jeremiah, let's go to uh, Ezekiel. And they're like, they're in the New Testament, they're, right? Can somebody that's sitting next to them or somebody that's around say, hey, let's get together on Tuesday for a, a cup of coffee and I, I'll show you what the, how the Bible's made. You know, how 
you know, it has so many books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. It's divided this way. This is why it's this way. These are the major prophets. These are the minor prophets. This is all history. This is all Psalms. This is all wisdom literature. This is all, you know, apocalyptic literature. Let me show you how to navigate through. What, you know, spend a little time. Relax for a minute. Help them get that much closer. Amen, right? Is that a speaking gift? In a way, yeah. Right? But empowered by who? God. Not because just you think it's great. Let God direct you, right? And so um, the next one is gifts of service. It says, whoever speaks, let him speak as if or utterance of God. Whoever serves, let him do so as by the strength with God supplies. Again, gifts of service, diaconio, which means serving one another, meeting needs. There may be needs that need to be met, relieving one's needs, supplying food, taking care of the poor, the sick, the widows, the orphans, military people. You know, military people sometimes, in, in, in our situation, we don't have a base here or anything like that, but we do have people that, that, that are in that situation that are like transferring or, or whatever, or they're serving in the guard or whatever, and they're gone for whatever, two, three, deployed for two, three months sometimes or something. Be that person that's connected to something like that. And let God direct what he wants you to do in that area. Uh, if there's a group that's lacking, look at the homeless. There's, there's people out there, there's a lot more homeless now than there ever was before in Roosevelt and Vernal. There never used to be this many, but now there's a lot more. Let's be a blessing to them. Let's be a blessing to our, to our law enforcement. You know, when you, when you see one of these guys, ask them if they want a, a biscuit or something or, you know, or make sure that they have, you know, don't we'll pull up and go, hey, <laughs> You know, roll down your window and kind of, <laughs> kind of like, you know, take your time, pray about it. But no, I mean, there's just a lot of different things that you can do to help uh, situations. Ministry of encouragement. I just, matter of fact, just sent Chuck a text earlier because he had sent me a text. I didn't know he was going to be here, but I kind of suspected he might. But, uh, but it was one of those like, uh, do you have a ministry of encouragement? Because he does. He encourages you with a little text or something. He gives you a little uplift, you know. And it's, so I sent him, I said, you have a gift of encouragement, Right? Chuck, I said it to you this morning. And so it's just one of those things that you just, just a little, just that little bit, just a little push, that little extra, you know, text that you can send to somebody, that email, that letter, uh, that, that card, that visit, something that can help them do that. And then, of course, there's uh, the ministry of fixing, right? Now, all these gifts are outlined in Ephesians chapter 4, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then it gives you how to, the how-to's. From 12 to 14. And we'll talk more about that next week. But I want to talk about the ministry of fixing. Okay? So the Bible talks about a ministry of helps. That's, that's a gift of the Spirit that we're going to be dealing with next week. Ministry of helps. What does that mean? Well, it could be anything. It's God directed. You know, there's people that are great at computers. They can just take, you know, I can be spending, pulling my whatever hair I have left out, trying to figure something out. You know, and it's like, I can't, I can't, I don't know. And then I get some kid, you know, that's 15, 18, whatever. They're like, done. I'm like, right? Or my wife, who can launch missiles from NORAD when, with a you know, computer. She'll say, here, fix this. And I'm looking at it like, how did you get in here? This is like the defense department. How did you break in? <laughs> she gets into the weirdest places, you know. So... <laughs> So I, I don't know, but I mean, some people have gifts, but again, directed by God. Make sure that, that it is. Whatever the helps is, make sure it's directed by God. God can give you a, a, a be able to help in a certain way that you never thought possible. You thought, well, I'm good at mechanics. Well, I'm good at computers. Well, I'm good at fixing plumbing. And it could be something totally different that he makes you a helper in. Amen? And that's what brings glory to God. When the love of God shows up through the fervent love and through these gifts, because it's not possible to do it yourself. It's not possible to do it, work it up yourself. Well, I'm good. This is easy for me because I'm good. No, it's like all of a sudden God uses you in a special way that you never thought possible. And that person recognizes and goes, wow. And what do they give glory to? Not you. Oh, you're so good. You're so, hey, you know, you're so... No, no, they give glory to God. And that's the whole point of spiritual gifts, that they don't ever focus on the person. It's when you see people on TV, and it's all about them, and it's all about my ministry, and this and that. 
just turn the knob. Oh, you can't do that anymore. What is it? Yeah. Speak to the TV. Get rid of this clown. <laughs> I just can't. But I mean, just move it because it, it's stupid whenever it, the focus is on the person. The focus has to be totally on God that gets the glory. So there's ministry of fixing, there's leadership ministries, there's all kinds of things that you can get into that God all of a sudden empowers you to be. Great leader, great ability to do great things that you never thought possible. All of us can serve in one way or another, and um, all of us can, you don't need a, a degree in theology or a degree in molecular physics to hand out food, right? You don't need to uh, have all this degrees on your belt to be able to speak to somebody about God. You just need to know what you believe and why you believe it. Train hard, work hard, get what you need, and then go out with the glory of God. Amen. So, so if, if, you know, if something that you'd like to do, and it's something that you feel that you're good at, again, give it to God. Say, God, do you? I'll tell you a story. You guys have heard it before. He's a truck driver. I met him when he first came out here years and years ago, nearly 20 years ago. And he came out, and he was, uh, had a pickup truck. And he it was a semi-driver, kind of retired, half-retired. And he was loading up a bunch of, of clothing and supplies and taking them to reservations in, in Arizona. You know, and, 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 and then he'd go up to Montana. And he'd go to all these different Native American reservations all around the, the western United States. And so he'd load up his, his, his pickup truck, his, his shell, completely you know, packed you know, with stuff, go up there and hand it out. And then he'd come back and get some more, go back, load it up. Then he wound up with a trailer, a little trailer. Then he got a bigger trailer. And pretty soon, because he was a semi-driver, he wound up with a semi and a really big trailer. And pretty soon he had five semis running, right? And other drives, retired guys that are taking supplies all over the United States, right? And you got guys in the, in the Assemblies of God, the Convoy of Hope, whenever there's a, a, a hurricane or a tornado or some kind of natural disaster, they load up all these trucks, fleets of trucks that go and deliver food, water, clothing, shelter, all kinds of different things to be able to meet the need. But this guy started with his pickup truck. Did he, did he sit on the couch and go, wait, Lord, when you provide me with shiny red semis, you know, and a beautiful white gleaming trailers with my, you know, stainless steel reefers on it, then I'll... No. He just started where he was. He grew where he was planted. And he started moving. So for us, it's, it's more than just a rah, rah, rah thing. I don't want you to think this is, okay, now I want you to get out and do, do, do. I just want you to recognize the pattern in your life. You know, and this is so, so important to recognize this pattern. First of all, get the right perspective, the right attitude. Be sober in your prayers, understanding where you're at. Target your prayers. Be specific in your solid prayers, unhindered prayers. Whatever's hindering you from a prayer life, get rid of it. Instruction, direction, compassion, motivation, all will grow when you put, put it into prayer, which will lead to fervent love and you'll start having agape love the love that only comes from God not love you work up not feelings not not just a natural compassion but God's love pouring in shooting through you decision of the will again leading to action fervent love a choice leads to forgiveness and restoration so let God handle the love quotient amen and that leads to being hospitable because once you have the love of God, all of a sudden you're more hospitable to things and situations. You share, you give, you help, you fix, right? Do Bible studies at home, whatever you do, which in turn will lead to the gifts operating, right? God's not just going to drop a gift just because, drop a gift, okay, I want the gift. You know, he's going to say, start walking. And as you start walking, all of a sudden, boom, here comes the gift. Like, oh, I can use this, you know, and, I, and you utilize it in the ministry that God's given you. God will unleash the Kraken. <laughs> He'll unleash the power in you if you allow it. Amen. If you're willing to move forward. And then you walk in that gift that he has prepared for you. And what does that do? Finally, verse 11, the end of verse 11. It says that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. See, when Jesus said, let your works be seen so that your heavenly Father can be glorified. 
See, your works aren't to focus on you. You should never, sh sh you know, the light should never be on you. Look, look what I did. Look what, it should always be about God. So when you do good things through the direction of God, through the love of God, right? Getting yourself out of the equation, more or less, your pride, your ego, all that stuff. Guess what shows up? The glory of God shows up. And who gets the glory? God does. They don't see you doing the work so much, although they might say thank you, whatever. But what do they see? They see Jesus. And that's what we all need to see. If we're talking religion, it's not worth it. Let's go watch football. Or something, hockey. <laughs> right? If it's just religion, if all we're doing is an exercise, but if it's about Jesus, it's about seeing his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, his incredible future he has, an incredible eternity with him, incredible adventures here and there. They start here and they finish up there and they never end there. That's what it's about. And leading others and seeing the light come on and seeing them go, wow, isn't that great? Isn't that amazing? You know, and, and giving God the glory. All to bring glory, again, through Christ. I, I'm sick and tired of people saying, the man upstairs or this church or this thing did this for me I get it I understand what they're saying but we better be speaking the name of Jesus because without him it's nothing this whole Bible is about him from beginning to end it's not just a New Testament thing Jesus was there in the beginning all things were created through him for him all about him so if we are afraid to mention his name if we're afraid to speak his name and give him credit and glory when it's due we don't belong in his kingdom amen I don't mean to end on a on a spank note but I felt like that's for somebody here I don't know who maybe for me but let's stand and pray <clears throat> Lord, you've given us all kinds of different gifts, but the greatest gift that you've given us is salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is the greatest gift of all. Without that starting point, we can't go anywhere. No matter how good we feel about things, no matter how much talent we have naturally, no matter how much ability we have, Nothing matters. All will burn up without you, Lord. And we want to serve you. We want to give our lives to you. We want to surrender our life to you. We want to turn from the way we were going and turn back to you where we belong. In your Father's house. Where you're preparing a place for us. That where you are, we may be also. So Lord, right now, I ask you right now, and I speak for all of us as we pray this in our hearts and our minds. Lord, forgive us right now for our sins, for our uncleanness, for our stupidity, for our rebellion. Help us to be able to be followers of you, true followers of you, not just in name only, but depending, transferring our hope on everything that you represent. Lord, take whatever abilities, take whatever resources, take whatever things we have and use them for your glory, Lord, as you direct. But forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Let me live a life that's pleasing to you. Let me never, ever let go of your perfect love that you have as you sacrificed yourself to bring freedom for me. And Lord, I ask this today in the wonderful, timeless name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, God will do incredible things. He'll put you on a journey that you'll never regret. Amen. God bless you. Dismissed from this place, but never from his presence.